Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we've got Philip Lorea, who is the editor of Minute Dot or Minute Dot. You take your pick, and also the author of a new—is it a novel or nonfiction? Uh, poetry. Poetry. All right, part-time job. Sounds like a winning, best-selling <laughs> book to me. Also, uh, Lee Welter, uh, EMS uh, instructor as well as a physician here in Sacramento. Uh, the IRS. Uh, seized $17 million over a certain period of time from business owners who pr were proven to be totally uh, guilty of nothing simply because they made suspicious deposit patterns. What is a suspicious deposit pattern, Lee? I would think it's anybody that has money that the IRS hasn't gr put in their gr grubby little hands yet. And, you know, to be totally cynical about it, but. Uh, based on uh, the persecution of the Tea Party people by the IRS, the IRS has, at least until recently, been a very powerful political weapon, which is one reason we might not see it um, repealed and replaced with something that makes a lot more sense. Uh, typically, if we want to discourage behavior, smoking, for example, sorry, Philip, uh, you tax it, right? What's the tax on cigarettes now? Two dollars a pack, three dollars? It started craziness. In a similar fashion, if you want to discourage productivity, you put a tax on income, the benefits of employment. You know, it's even, wor it's even worse than that. What the IRS was doing is they were enforcing, so-called enforcing, the structuring rule. And the structuring rule is an IRS rule that says that banks have to report to the IRS any cash deposit of ten thousand dollars or more. So people have so people would so people would deposit nine thousand five hundred dollars or something, yes. uh, because that's what they took in for the day, day's daily cash take. Right. And instead of depositing ten thousand five hundred dollars reportable, nine thousand five hundred dollars unreportable, the IRS came back and said, "You are purposely keeping it under ten thousand dollars to avoid our scrutiny." That's structuring. We're going to take the cash. That's what they were doing. Sort of a mindless to the, way to, to the go tune, about theft. To the tune of seventeen million dollars on otherwise totally innocent businesses. Well, it that could be worse. And that's a very <laughs> small number. Yes. Uh, there, uh, there was a case recently, I, you probably re remember this, a drugstore owner, a, a convenience store owner, Bodega, uh, had been depositing re his regular store receipts on a Friday afternoon and it was in the tens of thousands of dollars and over the course of several months he had something like $400,000 and the IRS just took it. And it took him two years to get it back. Uh, and was Without not interest. Okay. Without interest and at his expense, uh, and what's not generally known about civil asset forfeiture is that there is no due process. There are no judges. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a form, there's an arcane form that you fill out that's designed to be wrong and then you're rejected. And so you go through this arcane um, sort of adjudica adjudication process mm -hmm. That um, basically proving that your money is innocent, exactly proving a negative, which of course is logically impossible. And meanwhile, the money is being held there, yeah. Uh, and uh, it's no secret <clears throat> that the worst offenses, uh, uh, the worst uh, offenders of this are the most broke municipalities. Uh, well, this we're talking IRS here, uh, and the IRS, of course, is going after whoever they think can't fight back. Mm -hmm. which is essentially small business. And once again demonstrating, if I may be in my cynical self, lack of accountability in government. They can do awful things. In fact, there are times when judges have said the government <coughs> case was on the brink of fraud and, and uh, yet I don't think there's any, any accountability other than well, and it gets, Bad boy. Uh, and when you think about it, the IRS is, is, is playing uh, softball compared to the DEA. We're talking $17 million so, uh, seized uh, fraudulently by the IRS. The DEA seized over about the same period of time $4.2 billion, with a B, dollars uh, through civil asset forfeiture. And they don't take just cash. They'll take your RV, they'll take your car, they'll take the clothes off your back, they'll take whatever they can get their hands on if they can uh, get a drug-sniffing dog to alert or uh, think he might. Uh, alert if he if he was there. I mean, it's seriously. Uh, we say so. We're going to take it, 
and again, it's up to the uh, owner of the property to prove that the property, not him, that the property is innocent because the person doesn't have to be charged at all with a yes. drug crime or any other crime. And consequently, I feel sorry for law enforcement officers. I don't. Who, who, well, no, I, because they're, yeah, they're whores working for they're, the they're, man. They they have to do their job. Yeah, they well, they don't have to the take law, the damn job. But they well but seriously, they don't have to take a job of being highway robbers. But I have no respect for okay. the cops. Well, well and, and what about the law enforcement against prohibition? The I have no respect and, and, for them either. This is that same <laughs> argument, though, about um, uh, prohibiting the uh, inalienable right to pursue happiness, the driver's license. To stop somebody, it's the broken window theory of law enforcement, stop somebody, take things, and then see whether or not they can prove their innocence because they're probably guilty of something. And so oftentimes these are enforced against people that where they haven't been able to get any kind of evidence against them before enforcing the law. And so they say, well, you know, let's go in there. They're probably guilty of something. And that was the whole idea with, with a driver's license and registration is to say, okay, we can stop somebody and let's hope when we stop them we can find that they were guilty of something. And that's the whole process behind the DEA and, and everything that's happening. And it's frankly becoming something of a banking crisis because it is not generally known that um, the U.S. is the most underbanked country in the developed world. In other words, per capita, we have fewer people particip participating in the banking system than any developed country. Would that be because our banks are probably more unsafe than, than banks in mm, the no. undeveloped world? No, it's because government can seize the money. Well, that too, yeah. And so every time government says, well, here's a judgment against you, we're seizing your money, and now you have no way to defend yourself, and it could be anything or nothing. Yeah. And you point it out with the IRS or you point out with the DEA, they can simply take the money and then say, now prove to us that we don't, Prove to us we have to give this money back. Interesting greenbacks. It's just a, t a tad more difficult to, to do the seizure. Barely. Well, this triggers thoughts of uh, libertarian principle in the concept of victimless crime. Who's the victim of somebody who's accumulated a lot of money? Uh, not building voluntary customers. Well, it's, ta it's all about taxes. I mean, nobody should make any, nobody should have any illusion that it's about some sort of ethical or moral or rule of law or anything. It has to do with tracking taxes. Well, and that's well the it, might be, it might have something to do with the fact that it's kind of hard to make a living these days. In fact, uh, it's so hard to make a living that two-thirds of Americans, the whole working class population of Americans, two-thirds have saved less than $50,000 for their retirement. One-third haven't saved anything at all. That kind of impacts your business, right, Philip? It and it's something that I see up close and personal. Uh, the difficulty of doing it, uh, and the issue, uh, the issue is progressivism. It uh, so when we saw the <clears throat> poor thing about those poor people with the meals on the wheels and they got their program cut, you think about how do you get so poor? I calculated just as a middle class guy working my adult life that the IR that um, Social Security. If I had just had a payroll deduction in my own account, in the amount that Social Security and the, my employer would have contributed, I would have well north of a million dollars in an investment account. Had I done, been able to do the same with a Medicare account, I would have had I would have accumulated something like $120,000 in, let's call it a health savings account. Mm -hmm. So what's happened is that progressivism from, soci from Social Security and Medicare particularly uh, now add on to that uh, student loans, and which was you know exploded under Obama, that it is government itself that is impoverishing people, so that it is not there is simply not enough left when you you know when you're being taxed one way or another at least fifty percent of what you earn. Not only are you losing the incentive to earn, but there's just not enough left that you can possibly accumulate on your own. So. And, and people simple-mindedly think, well, if I put my money into Social Security, it's going to be invested and then it's going to get returned to me. But in fact, that money's been spent already. It's a Ponzi scheme. And any money that's coming in now is dependent on people who are still paying into it. And are we, have we reached the crossover point where things are starting to... Yeah, well, yeah, I think, I think the so-called uh, trust fund is starting to go down, which means that the, uh, the baby boomers are starting to retire, which means that 
the money being paid in through payroll tax is now less than the money being paid out for retirees, uh, which means that it creates a budget deficit because Social Security has become a budget item, not not a, not a trust fund. There is no trust fund. It's, yeah, it's simply it's been spent it. already. Well, yeah, I mean, go on. The money comes in, comes in. The, the back door goes out the front door, or, or vice versa. It never, it never uh, spends any time whatsoever in a vault or in a savings account or any any other uh, method of uh, traditional uh, saving. And no matter what, we're we're in a situation now of a social conflict where, you know, we the old are literally eating our young, and the young know it. So whenever you see any kind of a squawk about anything, whether it's to do with uh, Obamacare or whether it's to do with Social Security or Medicare, the old have been impoverished through the, the system, and they know it, but here we are, 60, 70, 75 years old, and now we want our money regardless of who it gets taken from, and the millennials aren't having any of that. Uh, so we're at this place now where you have a real social division, not merely an economic division. Well, and a political division. In my view, divisiveness is a very powerful and effective political tactic, playing one group off against the other. They'll promise the retirees, we're going to take care of you, don't <coughs> worry about that. And then they'll go to the young people and they'll promise free tuition, free this and free that and well you've got you've got a system where everybody and their cousin is trying to game the system one way or the other everybody is trying to win in a win-lose game and the only, a win-lose game is a, by definition a game where the government wins by taking money from the taxpayer who is the loser uh, and then the, the winner on the taxpayer or on the individual side is whoever can get the most benefits either in the form of welfare or food stamps or business subsidy or uh, protection from competition or other uh, uh, government favoritism. And I guarantee you the people who win in that game are not the people on the food stamps. The people who win that win-lose game are the people who have millions of dollars or billions of dollars to spend on lobbyists and are able Get to turn, special favors. Or turn, their, turn their K Street investment over with a hundred times return. That's what's happening. That's, what, that's a big reason of why 50 percent or, or th a, third, a third of the population has nothing and uh, two-thirds of the population has peanuts. There are two good books on that subject. One is titled uh, Conspiracies of the Ruling Class authored by Lawrence Lindsay, who is a former government insider. Larry Lindsay. Larry Lindsay, yeah. Okay. And the other one is titled Extortion by Peter Schweitzer. Larry Lindsay just came out uh, and, and made a, uh, an announcement, or not an announcement, came out with an analysis that says that uh, he thinks the Obamacare, uh, or not the Obamacare, the, uh, well, the A, Obamacare tax is going to get repealed one way or another, maybe not a very good one, but mm -hmm. a, some sort of a repeal. B, that the, uh, the Trump uh, tax cuts will get uh, passed one way or another, may not look exactly like uh, what's been proposed, but it will get passed. And that C, if all of that happens, and he thinks there's a 70% chance, if all of that happens, we're looking at a 3.5% growth rate compared to the you know 1% or 2% growth rate that we're, we're experiencing right oh, now. I, yeah, no, I've done the numbers on that. It is, it, we're north of 4% easy, uh, easily. If those things happen. If uh, if uh, Trump gets the tax, uh, the tax program through, and let's say it looks like a fifteen percent flat corporate tax, you know, no uh, no loopholes, and he gets essentially a tax-free society with uh, under fifty thousand, as he talked about on the campaign. Um, they're just talking about the corporate tax. Forget about the. But if you get, you almost have to have you have to have the individual tax in order to have the demand for no. whatever is being produced. But if he, what he talked about was, you know, common sense. Uh, and on the revenue side of it, it's by no means a revenue buster because you actually will in effect, uh, on the corporate side, you will double the revenue for um, uh, corporations from about 300 billion a year to 600 billion. And when you talk about, you've heard the statistic about half the population doesn't pay income tax, but they're paying all kinds of other taxes. And so when you get to that place where, when you actually talk about the, what it means to revenue, uh, for tax revenue, it's not si that significant. Take that three and a half, you will get to 
uh, you're really talking about on GDP, you're talking about $360 billion additional a year. That's 2% of our current GDP. Uh, that's a very achievable number. And if you take all of the money that's being stashed in Ireland and uh, overseas exactly. uh, by corporations like Microsoft and uh, Intel and all the rest, who, Apple, who are headquartered not in San Francisco but in Ireland because of the better, uh, the, you know, the, I guess a 12% tax rate as opposed to a 35% tax rate, yeah. they're keeping their money overseas indefinitely because they don't want to bring it home to be taxed. Get rid of that uh, of that provision, and you've got a huge, huge pool of actual investment capital that could be spent in the United States, as opposed to building plants in foreign countries. And the other part that they're talking about doing is they're talking about um, expensing uh, investment, as opposed to depreciating investment. So right now, if you buy a, if you buy a, I don't know, if you buy a a, 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 a pencil and eraser, that's expensed, right? That's, you know, some ordinary sure. small right. things are expensed. But if you want to buy a huge piece of equipment, of, of uh, equipment that makes the, the company more efficient, that cannot be expensed. It has to be depreciated, which is a disincentive to investment. It's a disincentive to uh, actually spending money to make the, the company more profitable and more prosperous. At the same time, you've got low interest rates artificially low interest rates because of Federal Reserve policy, which is a huge incentive to borrow a whole lot of money, and the, comp and the money that p the, the companies are borrowing is going almost net-net exclusively into either share buybacks or uh, dividends, not into investment for uh, the betterment of the company. Well, we were talking about uh, one of the things that uh, the virtuous cycle that uh, since last December Trump was calling all the CEOs into the White House and getting commitments to them. If I can get this corporate tax rate done, will you build and invest here? Yeah. And the upshot of that is, is uh, you know, just in this uh, ADP reducer uh, put out their private sector job report, the uptick in small jobs where the regulation has been so onerous, the small businesses, 49 or less, where the regulations have been killing them trying to comply as well as the minimum wage and every other thing they have to do, that uh, we have gone from uh, sm uh, small businesses creating 14,000 jobs last December to 114,000 jobs in March. And that is directly attributable to uh, the Trump policy on deregulation. That and, and hope. And oh, hope. Oh, and hope, hope for all well, of that. At least we have some hope now. Yeah. And, well, uh, we'll see. Uh, of course, you know, when the government collects all this money, they do spend it wisely. They spend it on sports stadiums. 71% <laughs> of the cost of professional sports facilities was funded, <coughs> excuse me, by taxpayers in the years 1987 to uh, 2005. Do you think about that when you go to a Kings game? Or do you go? <laughs> I, sort of, I don't. I, I sort, of, sort of killed my interest when this idea of the, that we're responsible promised that it's not going to cost the citizens or taxpayers anything, but try to find a parking place downtown. I, most people I know avoid going downtown. I simply don't go as far as I'm concerned. That part of town is just it's close limits. to me. It doesn't exist. I'll go, I'll go to Folsom, which is a wonderful experience, the yeah. complete opposite. Uh, and uh, I read in the journal this week that uh, Sacramento was bragging about how much more pa parking revenue they had collected. Uh, you know, that they're going above their projections. But at the end of the day, you know, you hear all the businesses around there and they're all folding up. It, it's producing nothing for I, them. I, I, I ride the bus to work. I work in downtown Sacramento. Ride the bus to work. Walk across Cesar Chavez Plaza uh, every morning between, the between 8 and 8.30. And I've been doing a, a census of the people who are, <laughs> let's put it nicely, who are camping uh, in Cesar Chavez yes. Plaza. And it runs anywhere from a dozen to three dozen over a one city block uh, area yes. uh, at you know eight thirty in the morning. I'm sure it's, it's higher probably at night before they start, you know get up and start moving around. Um, and boarded up storefronts uh, up and down J Street and uh, I Street. It's not a pretty picture in downtown Sacramento, and that's after the stadium that was supposed to be a, a economic nirvana was built. And. Yeah. All the studies have failed to find any real benefit 
to a community of investing in these uh, massive structures. There's only so many dollars in the town, and unless more dollars are coming in, which, I mean, maybe you can make that argument with big name entertainment, maybe someone coming from San Francisco to see McCartney or, you know, whoever's going to be here. But at the end of the day, uh, if it's $5 million into a parking meter, that's $5 million not in a restaurant, it's $5 million not in a movie theater. There's only, the pie is only so big, and an arena or sports stadium doesn't grow. All it does is it's, it, bor it borrows money or steals money from other entertainment venues, whether it's movies or uh, stage productions exactly. or uh, you name it. Yeah. That, that's, all, that's all that's happening. It's a substitution process. Uh, in Laguna Hills, the Laguna Hills High School has decided that it would be a really, really nice thing to do to take down the mirrors in the girls' restroom and replace those mirrors with uh, signs that say, you are beautiful, and other uh, uplifting affirmations. Do you think that's a policy that will have the desired effect? I guess first question is, what, what effect is it? Uh, what, what is the uh, effect of that policy? Well, it's going to probably speed throughput. I mean, it takes some of these young <laughs> ladies a long time to walk past a mirror. And my, one of my daughters is ex accused, at least one of her daughters, of doing that. She, you know, she sees a mirror and suddenly it's like a magnet uh, attached to another have the, magnet. Have the lipstick up the cheek, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it, it brings to mind, it, I think that positive attitude is a good thing. It is beneficial. And, I recall a cute nurse with whom I used to work who, if you take a photograph and you just look at her features one by one, not really impressive, but she was, had such a uh, cheery, optimistic outlook and friendly uh, attitude. She explained once, her father told you, if you believe you are beautiful, you will be beautiful, and she sure was. It's, it's a real example. I'm going to take the opposite side of that, Lee. I, you know, I think that we have to be realistic about what, you know, what is beautiful. Being told you're beautiful, and by your, to your mm -hmm. point, if I feel handsome in myself, who, who's to say I'm not? But who's to tell me that I'm not or that I am? And so in a perverse way, by putting up a sign saying you are beautiful, sort of denying what your own eyes tell you one way or another, is... Um, uh, it, it's false, and uh, to me, you know, there are times when I look, I look at myself and I say, you know, I think I put on a few pounds here, and I think I need to do something about that. That's healthy. And so I think that it is somewhat healthy for us to just be able to look at our mirror and not have the wall judging us and telling us we are either beautiful or ugly. Well, I think health implications are valid, but I still, I think, to me, the real beauty is how people treat other people? Are they kind? Are they honest? And that's what really counts. And how they look in the mirror, it's all right. But well, right. I have no problem. I look in the mirror and I say, where'd that handsome guy come from? <laughs> <laughs> uh, market repeal of Obamacare. We're, we're talking about Congress appeal, repealing Obamacare, but in fact, they've had a hard time getting the job done. In the meantime, the markets have been doing so. There's a place called the Surgery Center of Oklahoma, which I believe it's an outpatient surgery center, which is cash only. It doesn't take uh, Medicare, Medi-Cal, uh, or, well, Medi-Cal, Oklahoma, whatever that is. And doesn't take prices. insurance. They say this fixed is what prices, you're pay for this. posted. Posted yes, fixed prices. I like that. Sort of like a menu, like, uh, like going yes. into McDonald's and figuring out how much a gallbladder is going to cost. That's very uh, compatible with an uh, organization, an online system called Medibid. Mm -hmm. If you want to have an elective procedure, Say, oh, I want to have a knee replacement. I'll look down the list and say, oh, yeah, this is um, in Utah. I won't have to travel away to the Bahamas to have my knee done, and the price is Well, adequate. and that's what urgent care is, and they're all over the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, membership of, uh, you know, $79 an individual, 99 a family. Well, that's, that's another. Posted prices. Yeah, that's another uh, model that's being used, which mm -hmm. is primary care being provided by places like, uh, uh, like Gold Standard Pediatrics. You pay a monthly fee. Mm -hmm. And your your kid is taking care of whatever you know the sniffles, the uh, flu shots, the you know whatever whatever uh, maladies that they have, whether it's a lot or a little, uh, it's paid for with a monthly fee. And the physician and the family have no. But again, no insurance. Well, the family in the. Um, uh, clinic or physician have an incentive to keep people healthy to do things that will to keep the cost down 
Exactly, well, the, of the, course. It's good for everybody. The problem, though, is, and again, it get, gets back to that, the old eating the young. The reason that specifically was excluded from Obamacare, in fact, forbidden from Obamacare, is because it is, you make a market choice. You're 25 years old, you say, great, I'll do this, and I'll use this amount. The problem is it didn't collect enough money to pay for the 60-year-old. And that's... And the whole concept of Obamacare was using the young to pay for the old. Exactly. Uh, basically taxing, uh, grandparents taxing their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Well, that helped uh, keep us from electing, uh, what's her name, Mrs. Clinton to a high office <laughs> once again. <laughs> uh, th th that's, that's, worth, that's worthwhile. That's yeah. a relief. Yeah. And there's a, oh, I, I guess I mentioned Medibid, where you could yeah. go online and well, get and prices. Uh, uh, and it seems that, um, that the repeal is happening regardless. Uh, the, the repeal is, an effect, is a fact. And all the headlines about, you know, fail to repeal, no, the repeal was, it, it, that's natural. The question is whether it would be replaced. So the you mean Republicans it's natural in the sense that uh, all of the uh, many insurance companies are saying, no more, we're not going to insure in this state, that state, or the other state. Uh, and in the sense that there are doctors who are saying, no, we're not going to take Medicaid, we're not even going to take Medicare anymore because we just don't want to deal with the back office problems. And uh, no, we are going to go to a, a fee for service model, uh, which uh, we, you know, or or we are going to another another method that's been used is where. Uh, religious groups will say uh, we will, you know, pay in and, and, and pay out uh, based on uh, based on uh, on need. You know, pay in a certain amount and pay well, out. Well, if on, the federal on government isn't going to put money in and they're no, not going to yeah. enforce the mandate, there's no money coming in, and so it's and yeah. all that the government had to do was just not do anything, and it was repealed. Right. Uh, I have two metaphors for this business about replace. And my view is that government meddling has created a lot of these problems. Uh, one, when a surgeon excises or removes a cancer, a tumor, he doesn't worry about what it's going to be replaced <laughs> didn't with. didn't replace it with and, anything. And Thomas Sowell said, when a firefighter puts out a fire, he doesn't worry about replacing it with anything. <laughs> it solved the problem. And we solved the problem of, of, uh, of Obamacare by repeal, period. No repeal and replace. Forget about it. And forget about the people who are going to scream and holler and complain. Because it's really a very small number. And that's the show. We'll see you again next Very week. Good. Same time, Excellent. same place on Libertarian Counterpoint on the uh, uh, air at uh, Channel 17 in Sacramento, on uh, the web at www.accesssacramento.org, uh, on YouTube, and on uh, cable channels all over the place. Make sure you're listening at 8 p.m. on Thursday nights, noon on Fridays, and 4 a.m. on uh, Saturday morning. Uh, those are all Pacific Standard Time, and you know, adjust your your, your viewing habits depending on where you're watching. Terrific. Thank you very much, Lee Welter. Thank you very much, uh, Philip Larea, for being on the show. Thank you, Richard. <laughs>